Um, my name is Jessie Kelly. Hi, I'm the Government Affairs Manager for Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties at the R Street Institute. Thank you for joining us today to discuss why reinstating Pell Grants for incarcerated students is a bipartisan issue. Just a couple of notes of housekeeping. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you have a question. The panelists will dedicate some time to answer attendee submitted questions towards the end of the event. For journalists, if we have any of you joining, please note that this is an educational event and off the record. If you have a specific question on the issue, please feel free to contact me or any of the panelists directly. Before we dive in, I'd like to give a brief background about the issue and introduce our panelists. Incarcerated people have been excluded from the federal Pell Grant program since 1994, when President Bill Clinton signed a sweeping crime bill that, among other things, enacted the ban. Before then, college courses were available in detention facilities and were relatively common. In 2015, the US Department of Education announced the Second Chance Pell Exper Experimental Sites Initiative. Through that effort, 65 colleges, most of them community colleges, provide training and education at nearby prisons, while those incarcerated can apply for Pell Grants. The program was recently expanded under the current administration. Now, advocates and lawmakers are discussing legislation to lift the ban on Pell Grants for incarcerated students. Providing additional access to post-secondary correctional education will pro provide more opportunities for individuals returning from prison and ultimately enhance public safety. Now let's turn to our panelists. Frank Russo serves as Director of Government and Legislative Affairs at the National District Attorneys Association. Prior to assuming his current role, Frank worked as a law clerk for the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security and the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution. He's a graduate of the University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs and the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law. He currently holds a license to practice law in the state of Georgia. David Jimenez serves as a federal legislative strategist for prison fellowships advocacy and public policy team. His background is in public policy advocacy and institution building, most recently as one of the primary managers for the American Enterprise Institute's outreach to college students, faculty, and administrators. As an undergraduate, David studied history and political theory. After graduating, he participated in the Hudson Institute's Political Studies Fellowship and was a Fulbright English teaching assistant in Romania. Trelane Ito is a voice for justice in Washington, D.C., where he works as a congressional staffer in the office of U.S. Senator Brian Schatz. Trelane is a graduate of Pacific University in Oregon with a bachelor's degree in politics and government and ethics law and society with a minor in French. He's also a graduate of the American University with a master's degree in justice, law, and society with a concentration in social thought and jurisprudence. He's the co-founder and executive board member of District Democrats. Jared Wall was incarcerated in 1989 and served 26 years in Indiana. Being incarcerated at the age of 17, he entered counseling and the college program due to the mentorship of men serving life sentences who themselves had earned bachelor's degrees in prison. During his incarceration, he earned four college degrees and served for over 12 years as an administrative clerk for the on-site college program in a maximum security facility. After his release in 2015, he earned an MS in psychology and he is now a PhD student in sociology at Tulane University. He has spoken in several venues about the barriers to employment and admissions at universities after release and he has advocated for the return of the Pell Grant for all incarcerated individuals, regardless of the crime or length of sentence. Thank you all for taking the time to join us for this important conversation today. And with that, we're gonna jump right into the first question. Uh, Jared, I'd like to start with you. Historically, what has been done to support post-secondary correctional education programs? And in your opinion, what changes have you seen had the most positive impact in increasing access to post-secondary correctional education? Jared, I think you're on mute. i mute myself, yeah, sorry, <laughs> yes. my apologies. No problem. <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you, uh, first of all. It, it always, first of all, takes concerned people who secondly believe in rehabilitation. That's how the infrastructures get set up. But what actually historically has been the greatest support, it, it always comes down to funding. 
So, you know, you have, even if you have the people who are willing, the people who believe in rehabilitation, who's going to foot the bill or waive the bill? Uh, you know, I was kind of a dinosaur. I was incarcerated in 1989. So I began uh, my college studies under the Pell Grant and a state grant in Indiana. So, I mean, we're looking at what, 772 programs throughout the nation before the 1994 crime bill, this continued Pell Grant for prisoners. And then like overnight, it ended up just being a handful or two of programs left. Um, being in Indiana was rare. We were one of the states that continued with state grants till probably 2012, till they finally discontinued those as well. Um, but it just comes down that it needs a funding and a consistent, steady. I mean, but right now it's great. They've had plenty of uh, individual funders kind of before the second chance, but everything was so piecemeal um, that, you know, it just made it very difficult, but a, a consistent, steady source of funding like the Pell Grant was and for so many years uh, really is the, the simplest and widest scale solution. Thanks. Charlene, I'd, I'd like to move to you now. I mentioned in my introduction that you know, lawmakers are considering ways to reinstate Pell Grants. Could you tell us what the REAL Act is and how it will impact Pell reinstatement? And, and also, you know, how, how you've worked on it. That would be really interesting, I think. Yeah, so thank you, first of all, for in, inviting me to speak on this. Um, the Restoring Education and Learning Act, the REAL Act, we have been introducing over the past three Congresses, and it, it's a really simple bill that repeals the Pell Grant eligibility ban that was in the 94 Prime Bill. Um, this started off as like a very uh, Democrat-driven issue, but over the past couple of years, we've really made it as a, a smart bipartisan solution to solve a, a bigger problem. Um, the bill has over a hundred endorsing organizations from across the political ex uh, spectrum, from uh, Prison Fellowship and the National District Attorneys Association here, the US Chamber of Commerce, um, the ACLU and NAACP. So for a bunch of different reasons, I think people uh, understand the, the benefits on public safety that education has, the benefits on our, you know, reducing mass incarceration, um, the benefits on reducing the costs of mass incarceration, and then just generally the benefits to the to the economy and society of people returning, and most people will be returning from prisons back to their communities and making sure that they have the education uh, and the tools to you know live full lives and be you know engaging members in in their communities. Um, and so I had first started working on this you know way back when I was an intern in my office um, and prison education came up. I think the, it was the Vera Institute of Justice was doing sort of a series on uh, criminal justice reform because that was starting to be a sort of bipartisan uh, uh, issue that was sweeping, you know, the hill and taking a lot of interest. In. And so we uh, were the Senate lead on the, Re the REAL Act way back in the, what was that, 114th Congress. Um, and so at the same time, the Obama administration had started the, the Second Chance Pell uh, project and that, uh, the Second Chance Pell pilot project, and that really had sort of galvanized people's interest in, in restoring uh, education. And we saw a lot of the successes with some of the Second Chance Pell sites. And then there were a bunch of uh, studies that came out on, on its benefits. Um, and so we really built on that and helped to uh, increase the momentum on this and you know hopefully this Congress we can get it done um, but it was it was good to see the department expand the second chance Pell pilot and express interest in in Pell restoration um, and we've built our Republican support on the Senate side there's additional Republican support on the on the House side so this has moved beyond just just a Democrat issue and I think that's really important that everyone sees that this is a bipartisan uh, really nonpartisan common sense solution. Definitely. Thank you for, for all your hard work. You've really been the voice on the Hill to help us navigate um, how we advocate for this bill. Uh, David, I'd like to turn to you. Um, we haven't exactly used the term yet, but often when we start talking about Pell reinstatement, we'll bring up a clean list. Can you give us some background on that, what that means and who would be impacted? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Just to, before answering that question, just to provide a brief summary of Prison Fellowship for those who might not be aware. We're the nation's largest Christian ministry to those impacted by crime and incarceration. 
We were founded in 1976 by the late Chuck Colson, who is a counsel in the Nixon administration, but better known as the president's hatchet man. He would often propose things at the time that even President Nixon thought were a bit off the mark, like firebombing the Brookings Institution, famously saying he'd be willing to run his grandmother over with a bus to get the president reelected in 1972. Um, you could imagine, given that moral framework, he was um, implicated in the Watergate scandal, but before his federal prison sentence, he had a born-again encounter with the Christian faith, and afterwards, his time behind bars, he really felt a conviction to advocate and accompany those he left behind. So inspired by his legacy and leadership and memory, we now reach 300,000 prisoners each year nationwide and try to give them the community, the skills, the institutions they need to really confront the thinking that brought them to prison and to help them become responsible uh, Christian disciples and citizens in all aspects of their life, whether they're there for uh, a violent crime, a nonviolent crime, a, a life sentence, a, a terminal sentence, um, whether it's during their sentence or upon their release to our communities. Um, and we have a team of 10 to 12 who work on trying to connect that direct encounter with those impacted by crime and incarceration into the justice policy debates, whether in state capitals or on the federal side of things. Um, advocating for Pell restoration is one of our top priorities in the current Congress. And to build on your point, we're advocating for a clean lift. So we would like to see Pell uh, restoration fully restored for individuals, regardless of their conviction type or sentence length. Um, you know, for, for one, we kind of think of any exclusions based on conviction type as a category mistake in that, you know, distinguishing between a violent and nonviolent crime, the gravity of, event, of a sentence and offense is certainly appropriate in many aspects of the justice policy conversation. You know, when we're having good faith arguments about, say, uh, earlier access to parole or community confinement um, or clean slate legislation, and I'm sure many um, of the groups on this call or in the larger Pell restoration conversation might come to, you know, different points of view about how those distinctions matter in those conversations. But here, you know, Pell restoration is not going to be changing when people are leaving prison. This is totally a matter about conversing over access to rehabilitative constructive programming while behind bars. And so for us, we'd be concerned that making those distinctions is bringing a category that's appropriate in one aspect of justice policy debates into one where it's really not appropriate. Um, we also say, and, and we think this has uh, helped us in our conversations with center right groups and with Republican lawmakers that exclusions based on conviction type would be bad from a federalism limited government perspective. In that at the end of the day, uh, you know, education leaders on the ground, correctional leaders are best placed to determine, you know, which individuals would benefit themselves and others through higher education. A conviction type by itself cannot tell you what a prisoner's behavior has been like behind bars, what their educational abilities are, what their commitment to change is. And so from our perspective, having a long list of exclusions based on conviction type developed by Capitol Hill, which would be quite a lift given looking at federal code, tribal code, state laws, would really tie the hands and create red tape for those best positioned to identify and prioritize individuals for program access. We'd also think it would just backfire from you know, a public safety perspective, given the fact that 95% of prisoners ultimately return to our communities. That includes the overwhelming majority convicted of those with more serious charges. And so from our perspective, we want to ensure that our correctional staff have every tool needed in their arsenal to prepare this population for redemption and second chances and flourishing after incarceration. And so, you know, on our end, we think that having exclusions based on conviction type would really weaken the power of this reentry and workforce development if we just list limited to those convicted of certain you know drug possession charges or nonviolent offenses um, and you know as a Christian ministry it's just a human dignity perspective we think even those convicted and with a more uh, complex more troubling criminal history have the capacity and ability to pursue redemption and we want to have prison and facility cultures that recognize and honor that um, you know there's some people on the hill who I think would concede most of the arguments I would just I just made but might draw the line at lifers without parole eligibility. And so from that perspective, they would say, look, totally by the studies you're citing from Rand or Vera highlighting the value of this as a recidivism reduction strategy. But since these people aren't coming home, how does this make sense as a taxpayer investment? And we understand that argument, but you know, advocates for clean lift would also like to see individuals without uh, with a life sentence without parole eligibility also be included there too. Um, and Jared, I think could speak to this, you know, quite well given his own experience. 
I, I think I would just, you know, ultimately add and say that lifers make up 2.5% of the prison population, even smaller percentage of that will have a high school degree, will meet the requirements established by their university, by their prison, by the Pell program. So including this population is really not a big fiscal lift by any means. Um, second, we know that pro eligibility can fluctuate in states. And so we think, you know, establishing the ex exclusion in advance could prematurely deny someone a critical reentry investment they need as they prepare for their return home. But finally, and we see this as a prison ministry, we know that lifers are the culture bearers of institution. They have the power to define for better or worse the milieu and atmosphere of those facilities. And so we think having these programs available not just incentivizes them to do the right thing, to have something productive to look forward to that will encourage them not to create problems for their peers or correctional staff, but we think more fundamentally actually equip them to be mentors who are shaping the mindset and behavior of those uh, who will one day um, be part of our neighborhoods and streets. So we do think there's a public safety case for including this population, it's just a bit more indirect. And it comes from recognizing that prisons are part of our society too, and if we find a public safety investment that makes life better there, we should have treated with the same respect we you know, uh, give to other crime reduction strategies and in terms of the trickle down impact of their choices and mindset on their peers who will be coming home. Thank you, David, that's great. Jared, did you have anything to add to that question? Okay, you're, you're muted again. <laughs> again, my apology. That's okay. Uh no, uh, yeah, I could add a lot. I'll try to keep it concise. David did, did a, a really good explanation, but uh, the points to reiterate, uh, lifers set the tenor for the culture. Um, you know, they are the ones who are there the longest. They're the ones who can provide stability. Um, they are the ones, like it or not, who are mentoring the new generations coming in. Uh, I feel very grateful that I was, as uh, my introduction uh, stated, I was raised kind of, or basically mentored by lifers who had gone to college. Now, uh, before I've spoken about where we had uh, long-termers kind of on the range I lived in a cell house who basically, they were good guys from their point of view. They wanted to help me out. They wanted me to kind of, kind of join their group. And it was a, a, a biker club. Uh, again, they were good guys. Um, then they were wanted to try, hey, your next steps, we can start helping you sell some drugs. You can be independent. You can make your own money. Uh, they, in their minds, were helping me out. Um, that was one group of long-termers and lifers. Had another group up uh, in the college office. Um, they saw my interest in college. They basically started pulling me in and mentoring me how to run the college program. Uh, and then one day, one of the guys is a jailhouse attorney, got to looking at my case and ended up being the first person I really, really talked to about my, my case and my background. And uh, he says, you know what? I have a friend who's a therapist over in a psych office. He's like, why don't you go see her? He trusted her, I trusted him, so I went. College, therapy, and education completely changed the tra trajectory of my life. And two of those things are based on participation of lifers. I just think the, the investment for lifers, the ripple effect that they have, uh, helping set a better environment, helping others to, to learn, uh, helping others to change, I, that is worth the investment right there. And secondly, life doesn't always mean life. A lot of these individuals do get out. If something happens where their sentence is overturned, Laws change, they do get out, but the important thing to, to remember with the prison culture especially is that change individuals help others change. That's terrific, thank you for sharing. Frank, I, I wanna bring you into the conversation now. David mentioned earlier that you know 95% of state prisoners are gonna be returning to our communities. So my question for you is, is there a way to measure the effect that post-secondary correctional education can have on public safety in our communities? Absolutely, and I, hopefully I've unmuted myself successfully, but uh, thank you all for having us, and I'm, I'm glad I have all of my colleagues here who have worked, and I've probably spent months bothering uh, to bring NDA on board on this. Just a very brief background on who we are. We represent about 5,500 state and local prosecutors across the country, um, so it's probably a little bit of a surprise for a lot of folks to see our members in this effort, and I think it's part of your question, Jesse, that, that really gets at why we're here. And I think it's the public safety element. Um, how do we measure, how do our members measure it? It's interesting because as we see folks for a third, fourth and fifth time, by then it's too late. We've already gotten into that cycle of crime and at that point, it's gonna be very difficult to break it. So we view this as a rehabilitation effort and really a way to reduce recidivism that is now proven by things like the RAND study to actually work. 
and to make sure. And how will our members see it? Well, they, the, the second and third and fourth time they'll be seeing these individuals is when they go and get their, their graduation at their next employment opportunity and allows our members to be vocal and active in the process to assist in breaking that cycle. And I don't think that's a role a lot of folks view DAs as having. And quite honestly, I'm not sure it's the, a role that our folks initially saw themselves as having. But as we can play a more significant role in the process, and as our folks can kind of back efforts like this to reduce recidivism, we're confident that when those folks come, don't, aren't coming back to us, but are going back to the community and finding jobs, as, as you all mentioned, the Chamber of Commerce is on board. There are opportunities for these folks, but we have to set them up for success. We have to set these individuals up to succeed when they get out. So that, that was really how our members took a look at it. They, they really dug kind of down to the, the details, which is if we provide post-secondary education in prisons, will it lead to positive outcomes? The RAND study shows that it will, and the work by both the Obama and the Trump administrations to include these programs show that it will. And then what happens next? Well, it's, it's even better. Then they go into the communities with an opportunity to work and find successful careers. And Jared's an amazing testament to teach the next generation of students, both incarcerated and not incarcerated, um, in, in a way that you know promotes not just public safety, but the betterment of the entire community. Um, we, we can't just be in this for public safety. We're, our job is to do justice. So this is justice for the entire community. And so I, that's what really brought us on board, despite the fact that I, I haggled all the folks on this call quite a bit for probably months. Um, and I know that's why Trillane's smiling, but it was, it was really worth it to our members. And hopefully we can bring a law enforcement voice that shows that the public safety argument is not something that we're trying to trick you on or show you that it is not there. It's a reality. It's, it's a way to break a cycle of violence or crime that we have talked about and lead to positive outcomes, not just for the individual, but also for the community, for the law enforcement folks, for the whole kind of justice system. And I think that's an important role for prosecutors to play and, and for our partners in this effort to play. Hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely, thank you. I do wanna bring Trelane in on this question a little bit. How important to you and your strategy has it been to have such a diverse group of advocates support you? And then also, have you heard from your constituents? Do they like this bill? Do they think it's gonna be meaningful and beneficial for their community? Yeah, I think it's really important that a diverse group of folks, you know, Frank and David included, uh, support this because it shows that this, from a, a, a number of different vantages, this idea has a lot of support for a number of dis different reasons. You know, I think um, for some folks, the, the idea of rehabilitation is very persuasive. So uh, making that argument, I think, is really resonates for folks. For other folks, I think the fiscal argument, you know, uh, has more of an impact. And so having folks talk about the savings that uh, state departments of corrections will have with, you know, all in eventual reductions in uh, recidivism. Um, and then, you know, some of the, the marketability of people who will be returning to their communities that has is very persuasive. And that's why folks like the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable are on board. Um, and then from the, the education part, I think the values of education are, are really apparent in a lot of the, the higher education groups uh, support this. So uh, having those, those folks with the, the expertise in each, each of those different areas be the ones to say, this is why we support this for maybe all of the reasons, but per, for particularly the reasons that, um, are, that they work on the most, I think is really helpful. And I, that has been reflective in the number of co-sponsors we've been able to get this Congress for the real act, um, as opposed to previous con Congresses. And I think it really, you know, as Frank was mentioned, it, it, it takes a while, you have to talk to folks and really explain and walk through and then really take um, some of their concerns or maybe their objections seriously and have, you know, smart, cogent responses. Um, and I think that has been really helpful. And, and it's been a, a, a good process of bringing pe folks along who can then bring on other other organizations. Um, in terms of folks in Hawaii, I think we have had some uh, education programs. Um, I think the, the Kapiolani Community College has a, a culinary um, program with one of the prisons on Oahu. Um, but as a part of the, uh, the second cohort of Second Chance Palisades, we have uh, a university, the Shamanai University in Honolulu is one of those new sites. And I think there's growing interest and growing support for this in the state. And then as you can see in states across the country, I think over 40 now will have at least one second chance Pell site. So um, 
hopefully uh, members from all of those states can support this. And even if you don't have a second chance health site, uh, this is one way to get one um, or to get a prison education um, in your state and in your state prison systems. So um, we've been hearing from a lot of folks, both in Hawaii and across the country, that, that there is pretty widespread support for this. That's great. I want to turn back to Jared. I know a lot of conversations really um, when it touches every piece of the criminal justice reform advocacy space touch on collateral consequences and how difficult it is for an individual to return to, to society and to their community after they've served a period of incarceration. So my question is how effective are these correctional education programs in improving reentry's outlook? Uh, a good question. Uh, I think on re uh improving the outlook for the individual re-entering. Um, I, I think it makes all the difference. Uh, first of all, it makes all the difference of your quality of life inside. Um, I, you know, I talk sometimes about being stuck in a six by eight cell, but yet I'm participating in the thought of the whole world. You know, I'm on the battlefield with Achilles. I'm, I'm in a, a hut in ancient China with Lao Tzu. Uh, you know, just I was living in the world of the mind and the difference that made to my life inside the damage that that could have prevented from doing time, you know, I'm participating in something different. And so first of all, I feel like that made uh, where it, it minimized the effect that negative effects perhaps prison could have had. And then also um, participating in something much better at the same time. Now, so when I get out, what do I have? I have, uh, first of all, I feel like a lot of hope because I know what things can be, uh, you know, by studying, by reading. First, and then secondly, I have a critique. Uh, the ability to critique, and I have uh, by this time a critique on my own life. Uh, I have a new look at my own life, a better understanding of my own life. Because when you're inside, it's like each class isn't just knowledge to memorize. You're using it as a lens to observe your whole past. You're using it as a lens to look at yourself now. And doing that, that brings about a lot of change. And so I think what it does is it just makes you, when you're stepping out, you, by the time when you're inside already, you're asking, you know, who am I? What do I want to be and what meaning, you know, what gives me meaning? Um, and I just think it makes you face really those existential questions. So I think you're coming out in that mindset then that um, that's what you're looking for with that basis. So you have the critique, but then you also have the confidence, I think, that you build up, the sense of accomplishment. Um, you know what hard work takes for accomplishment. Um, and then I, I just think that uh, you just have a sense of opportunity that maybe you didn't have uh, possible before as well. Thanks, that's really important. And I guess my next question would be sort of directed at Frank, but, but any of you, please feel free to jump in. Um, all of those traits that you listed are really, really wonderful traits for employees to have whether or not you have been formally incarcerated or, or not. So what can be done to encourage more employers to hire formerly incarcerated people who have earned college credits when they were serving their period of detention? I'll jump in quickly, but I know that other folks have good answers on this and we're certainly not the Chamber of Commerce and they would probably give a good answer as well. But I, I just think one of the reasons that this question is important to law enforcement and our members is we have a role to play. And that is ensuring that as folks um, get in these programs, come out and show evidence that they are turning their lives around, we are involved often in the parole process, in the education process, in everything from reentry to some states that allow records to be sealed. Prosecutors and victims as well play a significant role in that process. And so when an individual has gotten that post-secondary education, I think it would lend a lot of value to the business community to hear from the law enforcement side of things or the victim side of things to say, we've also seen these steps and we've also seen these efforts being made. And we see as that employment as the next step and in improving that individual's life as well as the community as a whole. And I think when that voice is, is heard from the prosecutors, again, I think it may raise some eyebrows in a good way and show that our, our members are as committed to improving community safety in creative ways as they are in the traditional law enforcement ways, which is just prosecution and enforcement. So it, there, I think there's a role to play for law enforcement to assist the business community. Um, certainly not make the decisions for them, but assist them in those decisions. And I think our members, not just through supporting this effort, but supporting the individuals as they've shown success, can assist that, that, that moving forward and really help with the employment piece of this, which also does look like kind of that next step of breaking that cycle. We've now given them now those individuals the opportunity to come back to the community and, and prove it in a lot of ways. 
things. So that, that's the only piece I have, and I'm sure others have more. Okay, thanks, Frank. Uh, David, I want oh, to- I was just gonna add to, to build on Frank's um, you know, comment. You know, we've been advocating on PAL restoration well before COVID-19 uh, began, some of us longer than others, but we think the pandemic just makes uh, the case for the investment even clearer in the sense of, you know, over the past few years, we have seen uh, the unemployment rate among uh, formerly incarcerated individuals decline dramatically. Um, that's partially been due to really thoughtful state and federal justice policy reforms, um, the advancement of fair chance hiring laws uh, across jurisdictions, um, you know, the removal of occupational licenses that have, you know, really made it difficult for returning citizens to start their own businesses and pr pursue proprietorship. But a lot of that decline has simply had to do with a matter of self-interest, that when you have very tight labor markets and an un unemployment rate of 3.5%, that encourages companies and businesses to look for talent and seek it out at the margins of our society, and that includes returning citizens. You know, given the forecast we're seeing right now in terms of unemployment rates, that same incentive might not be there for businesses to look for these individuals without those people having a very strong resume they can point to in terms of the programming they've pursued behind bars. Um, so while I'm certainly not positioned to say whether we're going to have a V, an L shape, a W shaped economic recovery, um, it does seem like the labor markets will not be favorable for this population uh, for the remainder of this year and for many years to come. And that makes the imperative of this kind of workforce development uh, investing critical both in terms of skills that they develop and that they can point to when they return to our communities and just the signal that they can show an employer of the fact that they committed to this type of program and the sense of discipline, purpose, and commitment it requires. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we've sort of covered on a few things that, you know, our street really likes to think about when we're advocating the policy, human dignity, you know, building that self-confidence within a person, the ability to, you know, face those collateral consequences head on, the public safety issue that this is not making our communities any, any more dangerous, right? Um, but now I want to touch on something that I think is really equally important and, and maybe doesn't get as much attention as those sort of big headline titles, right? Um, we know that if a child's parent has a college degree, then that child is more likely to attend college themselves. So my question to you is how important is the family relationship when it comes to supporting an individual receiving higher education? And I'll, you know, I'll turn that to David or maybe Jared. Sure, well, I can just point to, and I'd love to hear about Jared's, you know, personal experience of his own or that of his peers, of fire peers. Um, you know, in light of the question you asked, Jess, I, I looked back on um, a personal testimony from a member of our Justice Ambassador Program. This is a nationwide network of volunteers we have um, who are trying to advance a biblically informed uh, perspective on justice reform in their communities. And those people have often been inspired to work with Prison Fellowship as a result of their own personal encounters, positive and negative, with the justice system. And so we have a wonderful member of that network, Valerie from Alabama, whose son is serving a 30-year sentence for a, a DUI that ended uh, in a fatal accident um, in the state of Alabama. And he is now pursuing a higher education degree through the Second Chance Pell program as offered at University of Alabama. And just in her conversations with us, and there's actually a, a video testimony, which I'm happy to lift up, you know, she has made very clear that um, higher education and, you know, the expanded moral and spiritual universe that Jared alluded to through uh, that experience has really just allowed him to see a future beyond prison. It's allowed him to confront demons that might not have um, been overcome absent that experience. And it's allowed him to think about the future and what he owes to those uh, he's failed in the community. Um, and so for us, you know, I think we're just really excited about how this kind of investment can really help people reflect and ponder the way that they can pursue redemption, uh, deepen their responsibilities as parents, as siblings, as members of the community during their sentence, and if they do ultimately have the chance to come home. I you know it's interesting too, when uh, I was incarcerated at 17, and you know, I, I received a 60 year sentence, um, which the minimum in Indiana would have been 30. Um, so if I stayed out of trouble, I would do sort of 30 years. Um, but when that happened, I mean, to my parents, they felt as if they had completely lost me, as if I'm 
as if I just died. Um, they don't know anything about prison. They just don't see that there's any opportunity there. Um, and then I think when they see me go there, I get my GED first and I enroll in college. Um, it was kind of like for me, for one, it was uh, that I'm, I feel like I'm not just completely wasting my life, uh, which means so much. Um, and then two, I think for them, it gave them a hope to see that I actually wasn't dead, so to speak, uh, that I had opportunities, that this wasn't just a, a, a place of nothing but pain and, 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 and the end of everything, um, that it was somewhere I could be rehabilitated or I could keep hope, that I could have opportunity when that time came. Um, and then I think it gives people a, a respect for their loved one who's inside um, when they come out, you know, because they've seen the work they've done, they've seen the commitment they've, uh, they've put in for school, that they see um, the, the education, the, the certification from a university that is respected. And, and that means something. I think that's kind of a, a stamp of validation almost. And they, they admire that, they respect that. And, and it's interesting, the point of children. Um, I remember for years seeing an individual in particular, and he did, didn't go to uh, the college. I'm not saying it would have made a difference, but I see, uh, I think it would have myself, but uh, his children coming in for years, I would just see him. So when I'm first incarcerated, they're, you know, waist high. And then I see him growing and then got transferred to a lower level, lower security prison. And, and guess who I run into? I run into this friend's children uh, who are now incarcerated himself, you know, and it's just, then you see the effect that someone who goes through, a college program and that giving a new narrative, a new path, a new possibilities and, and, and a new goal um, in their parent that they see that they can do that too. Um, that, you know, now we're talking about not just an individual effect, but we're talking about an intergenerational effect. Absolutely, very well put, thank you. I'm gonna incorporate an audience question Sarah has asked. Does the lack of access to Pell Grants affect the ability of incarcerated individuals to receive federal loans? And I think she's probably talking about federal student aid, uh, federal grant students in college. So I'll add on to that question. Um, Jared, you also mentioned that there were some state level scholarship opportunities. So if we could sort of build this into the answer, that'd be great. Yeah, um, generally you can't sign a contract when you're incarcerated. So therefore to receive a student loan, it's just, it's just not, you're not able to. Um, so even if individuals would want to, they, they don't have that ability um, is one of the things. So, so what we're looking at is we're looking at grants that anyone is eligible for. Um, it's just based on income level and inside the poverty level, of course, that no one's making much money. I think I was making 15 cents an hour um, that, you know, they are eligible for grants like the Pell or the state rather than a scholarship was actually just a state grant. So at the federal level, we had the Pell grant, the state level, we had uh, the state grants. Uh, it is a situation where when the Pell was discontinued, the state grant didn't really cover quite all the tuition, but that's where the university stepped up and they said, okay, we'll make a little larger classroom and we'll loan the books to people that they'll have to return. So they, they took a little loss too, but in the long run, everybody won out. Um, if that answers. Then. Definitely. Go ahead. Oh, sure. I would just build on, on Jared's point. This is something really important to think about in light of the economic contraction and changes to state budgets we're likely to experience in, in 2020 and beyond. You know, even after the 1994 crime bill passed, we did see many states, uh, including red ones like Texas and Oklahoma, decide to take the lead independently um, in advancing and expanding correctional education programs. But when you look at 2008, um, you know, according to a study from Rand, as that recession really uh, limited state budgets and policy priorities, we often see we often did see correctional education be one of the first things on the chopping block. And both all three of those states had to dramatically scale back this type of programming. Um, so, you know, I think our perspective here is that we don't think the federal government should be the only player when it comes to providing and supporting higher education in prison. We think states need to step step up. The faith community, business community, civil society. We do think the history makes very clear that if Washington entirely disengages from their responsibility here, we're not going to see these investments on the scale or breadth we'd like to see. And additionally, I think over half the states have their own uh, financial aid restrictions uh, for incarcerated individuals. And many of those restrictions are simply copying and pasting what's, um, they're basically following the federal law on this issue. So if you had Congress reevaluate its own approach to eligibility, you might actually force reckoning by state governments in terms of how they'll be approaching this investment. 
Definitely. If I could just jump in for a second mm -hmm. uh, to re reiterate David's point, I think the, the point of the real life isn't to sort of uh, supplant all of the the good work that some of the existing programs are doing, whether they're privately funded or if there is some state assistance, but really to uh, supplement that with the federal investment that was you know there prior to the 94 ban. And so I think it is our hope and it is the hope of hopefully all of the organizations that support the REAL Act to continue the advocacy work if and when this bill gets passed and the ban gets lifted uh, to ensure that states and also some of the private actors are really supporting this in, in an overall ecosystem to ensure that the maximum number of incarcerated people have access to you know correctional education because even with power restoration you know for the facility can have its you know program size classes can only be x size or the school might only be able to provide x number of professors so there are, there will be con um continued restrictions on sort of the number of people who can participate just based on sort of the programmatic concerns. And so I think additional state investment and additional private investment would really help to build on the Pell Grant, Pell Grant eligibility. Thank you. We have another uh, audience question, this time from Matson. Um, have your organizations experienced any pushback from educational institutions in engaging with incarcerated populations? And what strategies are you using to reach out to other institutions to create or expand opportunities? So Madsen, thank you so much. Um, that's a great question. The way that colleges interact with uh, prison facilities is based directly on the warden and the state laws and how that interplay can be meshed. Um, in fact, uh, you know, my role at R Street is to do a little bit of policy research as well. So I had the opportunity to uh, really dive deep into both Michigan and North Carolina and compare and contrast how those states were offering different educational opportunities. Uh, Michigan was one of the sites initially selected for the pilot initiative, and we've seen this really robust buildup of not only you know, college courses, but also technical training in that state. And it's, it's really impressive. Um, I'm happy to forward along those policy shorts that I did. Um, would anyone else like to take a stab at Matson's question? Jesse, can I jump in and answer maybe a little bit different of a question, but along the same lines, which is of how course. we deal with this within the law enforcement community and within our own membership. I, I think there is an education piece that Trelane and others touched on that, that does need to happen. And, and one of the pieces that I think we haven't really gone into detail and don't need to go too much but that this restoration doesn't impact students who are non-incarcerated right and i think that's an important piece that we had to educate our members and, and other law enforcement groups quite bluntly just to say you know this isn't going to impact the folks that need it in our families right the, the prosecutors and the adas and the, and the police officers who themselves face financial struggles and need the support as well um, and then the second piece was understanding that it, it impacts us all but fiscally and in a positive way because it ensures that these individuals are not the folks that we're re-arresting or that we're re-prosecuting and that we're breaking both that generational line that Jared talked about as well as that individual line um, that other folks have talked about. So I just think that education piece has been incredibly important for our membership internally but also for the law enforcement community broadly to understand that this, is, this will benefit you, it just may be indirectly and that it's kind of a, a goal overall that can, can improve the, the public safety in a way that actually helps your community and your, your bottom line. That's really important. Thank you for adding that in. Um, and I, and I want to make sure that we all have time to sort of issue this big question that we've posed today. You know, why is Pell reinstatement a bipartisan issue? So I'd like to give you each, you know, a couple of minutes to, to tell us and you know, why, why you think that this issue is so important and, and bipartisan. I guess I can start. Um, and really, I think the why this issue is bipartisan builds off of all of the all of the things that we've mentioned on, you know, on this chat right now, um, how this impacts folks for different reasons, whether it's the individual um, and, and their rehabilitative efforts, whether it's the individual and their family and their, their children who are not in prison and who can see that their the family member is going through this education, um, whether it's for the fiscal reasons, whether it's for, um, you know, just the overall benefits of education, um, whether it's for the public safety reasons, I think 
those, that speaks to, uh, to folks across the political spectrum. And it, it really, I, our hope is that this becomes one of the centerpieces of criminal justice reform, the criminal justice reform movement that we're in now, um, because it has such a such broad support um, from a number of different voices and, and, and really it just for, you know, whichever reason is the most persuasive to you, I think that's, that has helped uh, bring folks along. Jared, would you like to? Say? Yeah, I, I could go on several points. I just, I think Frank had an important point too. In the past, it was pitched the Pell Grant as a zero sum argument. In other words, every dollar going to someone incarcerated was a dollar taken out of the pot for, you know, working class families, children. That was not the case. Anyone who met the threshold got it. So everyone was eligible, you know. So that was a, a kind of a misconception that was put out uh, in the past. Um, and also, I mean, just if you look at finances, we know how it reduces recidivism. So we're looking at $30,000 on the average a year to incarcerate an individual. And we're looking at a grant, 4,500 for academic year is, is what we're spending. Uh, and that is gonna keep people out. It's gonna, it's gonna um, keep them from recidivating. So we're looking at 30,000 that's being saved every year that they're not re, someone's reincarcerated. Uh, and then maybe just the, Two other points I just want to make is, from my point of view, we, we can't refuse rehabilitative tools on a system level and then impute individual level blame. I feel like we have to provide the tools so people can change. And the thing we know about college is they do and they will change and they get that opportunity. I've seen it. I'm an example of it. Again, I could go on for a long time speaking of how just it just completely changed my life. Um, so much so that, you know, I'm in a PhD program now. This is what I'm doing with my life. And lastly, just want to say that I think, I think in the end, we look back years from now, I think if we do this, um, support the Pell Grant, it's reinstituted, I think we will realize that we are, are and we're on the right side of history. Frank? Sure, I almost talked through the mute there. Um, I, again, I, I go back to my own membership and, and think about something our president says all the time, which is I, I don't see when I meet with other prosecutors an R or D next to their name. I just see the prosecutor and the work they're trying to do. Well, I think this issue is a great example of that. Community safety doesn't need to be a partisan issue and, and improving the lives of our, those in our community and those who are re-entering our community shouldn't be a partisan issue. I worked on Capitol Hill long enough to know that everything can become a partisan issue. Um, but this specifically doesn't need to be. And so why does it have that bribe bipartisan appeal? I think as we've worked through this issue, as we've addressed the financial concerns and the, the reform concerns, we've really seen that it, it improves across party lines. It improves the communities, whether it's in a, an urban D district or a rural R district or however you want to classify it. it. It really does see a positive, a net positive for each community. And at the end of the day, that's why a lot of us in politics got into the business. So hopefully that's kind of a call to action for the folks who aren't on board. Nice. David? Sure. I mean, I think the key source of bipartisanship for this, this whole conversation is that um, we often have very difficult debates and arguments, whether as a matter of when someone should leave prison, as a matter of justice and public safety. We saw that in the years leading up to the First Step Act in many previous decades in American history. We're even seeing it now in some really tough conversations about what decarceration should look like uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and those conversations are, are valuable and critical and important to a just society and a decent criminal justice system. Um, but we also think it's critical to have conversations about what kind of people we want to see uh, when those individuals leave prison and what type of atmosphere should be defining uh, their incapacitation and their punishment. And we think on those issues, uh, we can find common ground and power restoration is really the great epitome of that. Um, and I finally add, and I think when you look at the co-sponsorship lists for both bills, it's, it's probably no accident that you see on both sides, um, a lot of very strong people of faith. What comes to mind, especially on the REAL Act, are, are Senators uh, Kevin Kramer and, and James Lankford, who are strong evangelical Christians. And I do think there's a connection there for, for them and for prison fellowship and the recognition that no life is beyond God's reach and his ability to heal and transform individuals. And for many of those behind bars, higher education is the best way for them to pursue an avenue of redemption and second chances for themselves and for the communities they've harmed through their past mistakes. Thank you so much. 
And, um, you know, I just, I wanna give a moment to thank our audience for attending, to thank our panelists for being here. If there's, you know, any further calls to action or final concluding thoughts that you guys would like to share, uh, you have a few minutes to do that. Uh, or if not, we'll, we'll give people a little bit of their afternoon back. Okay. Well, I, I just one um, thing, just to note the, the bill number for the REAL Act is S1074. Um, and then on the House side, the bill number is HR2168. Um, just flagging that for folks for their awareness if they would like to look up the bill. It's very simple. Um, and uh, I think we have additional information on Senator Schatz's website. We have our one pager and then our updated list of endorsements. So if folks are, are interested in looking at that to, to learn more about the issue, I think that would be helpful. And then um, I think most of the organizations that have endorsed have their own one pagers. Uh, our street has written a lot, uh, like all of those uh, tweets. Um, uh, NDA and then uh, Prison Fellowship also have, have resources and explainer, explainers on, on this issue. So um, I really encourage people to, to look this up if this is of interest. Thank you so much. And you can definitely find us all on Twitter if you'd like to reach out with, to us, to any of us with questions. We're happy to do that. And um, yeah, thank you guys so much. I would say a round of applause, but I guess we can do that remotely. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.